Welcome to the Foreign Saints podcast, a pulse check for those who die daily. That is our slogan, but what do I mean by that? What do I mean by a pulse check for those who die daily? All right, I'm Kari Rowe. I'm a respiratory therapist that works in uh, that works in a hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's as uh, specific as I'll get about that. Um, but I love Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He died for me. His forgiveness is the foundation for my life because His grace is a better foundation for life, for your life, than merit, right? But what do I mean by that slogan, right? In medicine, one of the things that you definitely do is you definitely, you know, you check pulses. And you know, no pulse, no heartbeat means either death or death is imminent, right? So when I say a pulse check for those who die daily, right? Well, who are those that die daily? They're, they're us. They're the body of Christ. They're those that are proclaiming faithfulness to Jesus Christ, right? So doing a pulse check on that community, are we alive in Christ, right? That is my passion for this podcast is reaching out to Christians that maybe feel like their faith is a little dry, reaching out to Christians that need encouragement, um, conviction even, because we do need that too. Um, and just lifting up the beauty of Jesus, lifting up the foreignness of Jesus's kingdom, right? And if that phraseology seems a bit mysterious to you, then keep on listening, right? Um, because I'm a big believer that Jesus's kingdom is better than any system of thought, any way of living, any lifestyle that this earth has to give, and that judgment is coming. Um, you know, Jesus is coming back, and those that aren't, uh, those that aren't his um, you know, there, there's wrath to pay. And so we got to get the message out. We got to get the gospel out. Um, and, you know, for those of you that may have listened to Meredith and I in our foundational episodes of this podcast, um, yeah, it's it's been a while. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, it, it's been a while. We've had a lot of things go on. I've graduated from a program, you know, got hired on, um, you know, handling a son, um, got a second one on the way, uh, whoop, whoop. Um, you know, just, just moving a lot of pieces around on the chessboard of life. Um, right now, just being in the prayer closet for uh, the last few weeks to figure out where God wants me to go with this. And I believe he wants, uh, I believe he wants this podcast to continue. Um, so like I said, just been moving things around on the board, but today, uh, just to get into it, um, I plan to I, I plan to have at least two episodes out a week. That is what we will aim for. Um, no consistent days, so that would be a reason to subscribe and turn on notifications for the podcast. Um, but for this episode, um, I always want at least one episode a week to be digging into a story of some Christian martyr from around the globe, right? And today's story comes from Nepal. Uh, my wife is a subscriber to the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. It is a free, say it again, it is a free magazine subscription um, once a month with stories of persecuted Christians from across the globe. Now, I like to take one or two I would like to take one or two um, a week and just challenge us, right? Using these stories as a pulse check for us, right? What do we feel when we hear these stories, right? Um, we're going to read the story. Uh, there's, a, there's a scripture um, that I have uh, with this to kind of tie the kind of tie it up in a bow and then we're going to have some we're going to have some real talk, fam. We got some real talk, some some pulse checking. Um, so, from Nepal. This story is entitled A Big Stick, A Bigger Jesus. Um, and before I get into it, let me just say some of y'all are experiencing um, hardship in your Christianity, whether it be from friends, whether it be from family, as this story is going to have. Um, let this story encourage you, if that's you, right? That Jesus sees you, that Jesus is worth the pain, that he is worth going through 
for him, right? And for those of us whose Christianity has been quite comfortable, let it challenge you, right? Let it challenge you. Do you react? Is, is your gut reaction hearing this story the same as hers? We'll see. So from Nepal, a big stick, a bigger Jesus. Growing up as a Buddhist in Nepal, Min Maya made fun of her Christian friends. She occasionally visited the church in her village to get free school supplies, but otherwise she had no use for Christianity. And her mother didn't even like her accepting free pencils and paper from the church. Min Maya's mother was a Buddhist lama who performed rituals to bless the many villagers who requested her services. So every morning, Min Maya was required to join in Buddhist worship at the family shrine. When she was old enough to leave her parents' home, Min Maya moved in with her older sister in the Nepali capital, Kathmandu, where jobs were plentiful and the pay was better. While in Kathmandu, she became severely ill, and her mother sent Buddhist priests to offer remedies. Min Maya's health remained unchanged, so her sister, Suku Maya, who had received the Bible from a Christian friend, invited some Christians to pray for her. Min Maya's health quickly improved, but she worried that accepting the Christian's prayers might mean she had to become a Christian. That's interesting. Then, when another Buddhist priest learned about Min Maya's illness and prayed for her, Min Maya's health again deteriorated. She knew she had to call the Christians for help. That night, a pastor and his wife visited Min Maya and prayed for her. That was the right moment for me to know that I must follow the Lord Jesus Christ, Min Maya said. But my mom disagreed with this decision. Min Maya's family soon decided that she needed to return home, and her mother urged her to find another llama to pray for her. If I go to the llama, I will die, Min Maya thought. I don't want to die. I want life. And just let me just kind of interrupt that and just kind of think, right? Like, do we do we really understand that that you know other <laughs> religious systems lead to death? Like, and this is one of our first pulse checks moment, pulse check moments, right? Like we live in a highly pluralistic culture in a culture that wants truth to be relative in a culture that doesn't want any rockage of the boat by, you know, intolerant Bible thumpers like me and perhaps you, if you're listening and you know, being steeped in a culture like this, and especially without knowledge of where these false religious systems can lead, you know, we can very easily grow apathetic. We can very easily kind of get cowardly towards the call of Christ um, to proclaim the gospel to people that don't know the way, the truth, or the life, to people that are currently dead in their sins and are living under, currently underneath the wrath of God on them right? So often in our culture, man, the, the reaction to that sort of thought is, oh, you're taking this too seriously. Oh, that, that, that that's not true. You know, I'm, I'm glad Christianity is true for you, but you know, you know, all religions are really the same, right? They really teach the same things, right? And it's so easy to drink from that well without knowing it, right? But Min Maya was brought to a place, and sometimes it sometimes it takes what she went through, right? Like I see it in, I, you know, I see it in the hospital, I see it in ICUs. Like some sometimes it takes um, having all of those securities ripped away for people to really see, yo, know, like I want life, I, I, I want life, I don't want to die, all right? I, I don't want to die, I want life. Do you want life, Christian? Do you? Because he has it. Jesus has it, but it, it takes your full commitment. You got to be on board. Not perfect, just on board. Right? Let's keep going. When Min Maya told her parents that she had been healed through the Christian's prayers and wanted to attend church every week, her mother became very angry. If you go to church, she shouted, I will kick you out of this house. Oof. Oof. That's tough. Min Maya spent the night at her aunt's house, and the next day she returned home and began attending church secretly. Each Saturday, the day Nepali Christians gathered for worship, Min Maya waited for her mother to leave before taking a 20-minute bus ride to a church in another village. After about a month, some neighbors discovered where Min Maya was going and told her mother. 
When Min Maya returned that day, her mother tried to hit her with a large wooden board. So Min Maya ran to a friend's house and called her pastor. The next day, Min Maya gathered her courage and returned home to speak with her mother. But her mother, still in a rage, ordered her to leave and not come back. It was a very fearful moment, Min Maya said. After taking refuge for several nights with a Christian family and then in her church, she was invited to a Christian training program in Kathmandu. Meanwhile, she stayed in touch with her father, who was careful to keep his phone away from his wife so she wouldn't know he'd been talking with Min Maya. Several months later, Min Maya's mother called and said she wanted to see her. After the family shared a meal one evening, Min Maya's mother pulled out a big stick and brandished it at Min Maya and her sister, who had returned home during the pandemic. Who is the biggest? Her mother asked. Is your mother the biggest or is your Jesus the biggest? When Min Maya and her sister replied that Jesus is the biggest, their mother struck Suku Maya's leg and then walked towards Min Maya. Her brothers and father protected her from harm, but Min Maya's mother continued to oppose her and her sister because of their Christian faith. Every Saturday, their mother would stay by the front door with her stick, preventing the girls from leaving the house to attend church. We decided Jesus is with us, Min Maya said, so why don't we pray one-on-one -on -one inside the house? Realizing that the girls were praying when their eyes were closed, their mother ordered them not to close their eyes. Then she hid food from them, leaving the girls with nothing to eat. When she offered them rice, they knew she was purposely serving them food offered to idols at the temple. During her difficult time at home, Min Maya took comfort from the Gospel of Matthew. The major thing was that Jesus came into this world for our sins, and he experienced pain like we experienced, Min Maya said. Jesus also suffered for us. That is really special for me. One night, after Min Maya's brother became so angry that he beat her, the sisters decided they had to leave. A frontline worker helped them get training to become tailors, and they soon opened a shop where they produce formal gowns like wedding dresses. Christians have helped them purchase five sewing machines, and they've hired another Christian girl to work with them. The sisters live in a room above the shop, but the building owner has warned them not to allow Christians or foreigners in their store. One of Min Maya's favorite verses is, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. That is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. The sisters' relationship with their family is still difficult, and their mother and most villagers blame the recent death of the girl's father on their Christian faith. Min Maya, now age 23, continues to follow the Lord, rising early every morning to read the Bible, pray, and worship. Worship is the best for me, she said. It's like the heart-to-heart -heart time with the Lord. All right? And so, you know, I just have... What, is, what does that story do for you? What, what does that story do to you? All right? What are some of the... You know, what, what are some of the biggest things that shock you in that story? For me, the thing that I definitely underlined is, men, is the question of her mother right? Who is the biggest? Her mother asked. Is your mother the biggest or is your Jesus the biggest? Right? And, you know, if you're a Christian that lives in the Bible Belt, um, it's very, uh, it's very possible that, you know, you just don't really think of this sort of thing as being a potential reality for you. Um, and again, I'm not you know, saying this, trying to make people like paranoid against their families or anything like that. But, but, you know, run that thought exercise through your head, right? Like if, if following Jesus meant that your mother or father or whoever it is, the person that raised you, right? If that person comes to you with a, with a stick, with a plank of wood and says, who is the biggest, me or Jesus with the threat of physical violence in tow? What's your reaction? Right? What should your reaction be? You know? And, and, this is why I, and this is why I say pulse check, right? If, and you know, maybe this one's going to be a bit piercing, right? But if, it, if, you had to, if you had to sneakily come to church, 
right? If, if you had to sneak away from your family to go worship with other Christians and hear the word preached, would you? Does Jesus mean that much to you? Is he your everything? Right. And I and I have a verse here out of Luke's gospel, um, Luke 12. Uh, oops, sorry about that. If you if you heard that um, Luke chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 51. Right. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? It's an interesting question. Right. That Jesus asks the crowds. Do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? Right? It's a very common misconception, and Luke's gospel kind of challenges that in a couple of places. Um, you know, that idea, you know, that you kind of get around Christmas time of like baby Jesus and like, you know, God sent Jesus into the world to give the world peace and all this stuff. Like, like biblically, that, that's, that's not quite true. And unbelievers would, unbelievers that are hostile to Christianity would love that message to be true. That, that Jesus came into the world preaching a vague message of peace and and love, but but not a difficult message of peace only comes through repentance and uh, repentance and leaving sin and finding peace with the Father through Him. P- people don't want a Jesus that preaches that message. They don't. They don't. And if that's the Jesus that you believe in, if that's the Jesus that you preach, then you got to understand that this world doesn't want you either. Right? You got to understand that you are a foreigner to this world. Right? And perhaps, perhaps that is the, that is the missing link in in your Christian life of, of the, of the vitality coming back to your Christian life or the vitality just coming at all to your Christian life is an acceptance of the foreignness of the gospel an acceptance of the fact that Jesus's kingdom truthfully is not America, that Jesus's kingdom truthfully has nothing to do with the comforts of your life. And, you know, the things that, you were aiming for your life, right? Like, like the vitality and the life and the vigor and the beauty and the love and the peace and the grace of a Christian life comes in full submission to Jesus, no matter what the cost, right? No matter what the cost, even if that cost is a cross physically or socially, as in Min Maya's case in our story, right? I mean, she, she experienced some physical pain to be sure, but a lot of her persecution was was the social, was the social stress of 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 peace being robbed in a family, right? And so often in our American version of Christianity, we think that if a person's path with Jesus leads them into conflict with those around them, then for whatever reason, we default into thinking that the problem must lie with the Christian who's doing their best to follow Jesus, right? And if that's, if that's our gut reaction, then I would, I would, uh, I would wager that there's some disconnect in our understanding of the gospel, and our understanding of the gospel of grace. It is a loving message. It is the best message out there, but to a sinful world that's foreign, that's foreign to the kingdom of Christ, that's foreign to the glories of God, and at home in their sinful rebellion against their creator. It's not always the best thing they want to hear, and sometimes they will shoot the messenger, right? That, that's just the truth of Christianity, Right? Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? You really think that? You think I came to give you think I came to give the earth peace? You really think that's why I came? How does Jesus continue? No, I tell you, but rather division. He says it straight up, right? I didn't come to bring peace to the world. I came to bring division to the world. Right? I, I came to separate those that are gonna be foreign for my kingdom from those that want to be at home in the world, right? I've come intentionally dividing people, right? 
No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, says Jesus. This is Jesus talking. You gotta, you gotta wrestle with this. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, as in our story. Mother against daughter, yeah? And daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There will be a dividing line. All right? There will be a dividing line. And that might be that might be the biggest uh, pulse check of this episode is do are you accepting of the fact? Are you okay with the fact that your Christian faith is going to is going to bring a division? Your walk with Jesus, your faithfulness to Jesus will at the same time cause you to love the world more while at the same time causing clear delineations and divisions between you and the world, right? Paul in Galatians, uh, I believe it's Galatians, uh, in the later chapters will write, I, Paul, am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me, right? That there is a dividing line and that dividing line is the cross, right? Stay, if, if you stay out of the cross, you're in the world. If you identify with that man hanging on that ragged cross, You live. You live. But there is a division. There is a very clear division. And that is part of the reason that persecution and hardships are promised to us as believers. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm going to, you know, going to kind of pause right now to take a bit of a break. uh, You know, bring in a, you know, bring in a musical interlude perhaps. But, um, you know... You know, while the, you know, while the music's playing, man, just, I want you to really consider that, right? Consider what all has been said and consider whatever it is that God is saying to you, um, through what's being said. Yeah. So, you know, enjoy the break and we'll be right back with the show. Welcome back. Hopefully I managed to get the editing right. And you guys actually managed to hear the full version of both of those songs by Stephen the Levite. Uh, on his album, To Die Is Gain. Uh, I highly suggest listening to it. It is great catechistic stuff. Um, a lot of challenging stuff, a lot of convicting stuff that just falls right in line with what we're talking about today. If not, well, you know, let's uh, let's just keep on pushing, right? Um, again, got another scripture from Jesus out of John um, that we're kind of going to, you know, discuss and unpack here. Uh, in the back half of today's episode, as we, you know, as we kind of ask ourselves, you know, what what do we learn from from Min Maya's story and other stories like hers, right? <clears throat> what do we learn? Um, to kind of answer that question, I have here um, a letter from the president of the voice of the martyrs organization. Right now, uh, in the beginning of the magazine, he always he'll always put a you know a letter from him kind of mentioning the through line of the stories that they've compiled in that month's uh in that month's issue so i won't read his entire letter here um but i will read kind of the middle section here uh many people respond to opposition by seeking instruction in the particulars as if a how-to guide or seminar might teach them how to overcome it right? Talking about persecution, right? We're always wanting to know how to respond in a very specific situation, right? Like if, you know, if a trans activist comes up to me and it's a Tuesday and the weather's doing fine, you know, then what do I do, right? Like we always ask very specific questions and sometimes it's good. Sometimes we kind of get in our own way. But hear what, hear what the president of the organization says, right? But scripture does not provide this kind of instruction. Having worked with persecuted Christians around the world for more than 25 years, I can assure you that no training curriculum or checklist of supplies will prepare you for persecution the way they might prepare you for crises such as natural disasters. 
Persecuting groups and regimes often overwhelm Christians' physical defenses, and anything that can be stockpiled for a crisis can also be stolen by an enemy. Right? Matthew 6.19, moths can eat that. Rust can destroy that. It's not just your possessions, but your defenses too. And he goes on to say we are called to actively advance God's eternal objectives rather than merely defend our possessions in this world. Right? America is a really extravagant place. Um, not just in the world today, but just in the landscape of world history. Right? Of human history. This might be potentially the most lavish and extravagant nation to have existed under the sun at all. It's very tempting. All right. The temptation to covetousness and fear and protecting what's mine has always been a part of the human condition, but even more so here in America. Even more so here in America. And I, and I get it. I get it. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian content creator. I'm supposed to be making content that rails against the leftist agenda and, you know, the radical trans activists and all sorts of other stuff. And they'll probably have their own episodes another day. But in all honesty, from my perspective, those things don't, those things don't seem to pose, um, as big a challenge, I suppose, to the Christian church from what I see. Now, they are a challenge. They are a problem to be sure. But there's these other sleeper problems that we can miss, like taking our eyes off what's most important, right? Actively advancing God's eternal objectives, a.k.a. the glory of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, rather than merely defend our possessions in this world. We cannot possibly prepare for persecution in every particular. So God has given us something much better than training seminars, instruction manuals, or checklists. In addition to Christ's example, God has given us countless testimonies of our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. In scripture, throughout church history, and continuing today, their testimonies exemplify biblical discipleship in the face of any opposition. Their stories are our Christian heritage, right? The church is a gift. Don't shy away. Use it. We must pass on this heritage to the young people in our lives. But hear this. We sometimes err by overemphasizing the transfer of knowledge while underemphasizing the importance of exemplars and of being one, of, and of being one for them ourselves right man in our christian culture we love knowledge and that's perfectly fine all right like you can ask my wife i study a lot right her and i are personally going through isaiah there's a lot of study going on there i, I teach at least a couple times a week um at least two times a week to not include the podcast episodes I'm like that i like knowledge i think it's useful um but part of deficiency happens when you think that your entire Christian maturity is dependent solely upon the transfer of knowledge in biblical trivia and stuff like that, right? You need examples. So I, Paul would say all the time throughout the New Testament, mark those who are following the example we've set out for you and follow after them too. You know, follow me in as much as I follow Christ, right? Examples are important. Exemplars are important, right? I mean, just think of how important Jesus is as an example, right? He's, he's the word of God on two feet, right? The Proverbs come to life, the prophecies fulfilled, right? You want to know how God would react in a situation. You look no further than Jesus, you look no further than Jesus, and you see God in the flesh reacting to situations, right? And if the gospel is true, God is in your flesh, not in the not you know not not like Jesus to be sure, but but when you're walking after the Spirit, you truly do become a useful example to the Christians around you, and we need useful Christian examples uh, to us, 
Um, you know, and sometimes, sometimes you just don't have that in our culture. You know what I mean? Like we got churches out here that are sometimes they're wrong and other times their theology is fine. It's just shallow. You know, it's not enough to, it's not enough to carry you through anything. It's not enough to inspire, um, you know, faithfulness and fidelity to Jesus. Hang on, let me get a drink here. Mm. Powerade, great stuff. Like it's not enough to, it's not enough to spark faithfulness and fidelity to Jesus. It's just enough to, you know, kind of numb you and pacify you for the next, you know, six seven days or so. Right, like, like our goal. Like, let, let me ask. Let me let me press a bit. Right? Do you really believe that the point of your life is to just be comfortable? Right? Do you believe that you win the game of life by collecting all the pieces by the time you get to the end of the board? Right? Like, it's another Christian rapper, Bizzle's got a song called Monopoly. You know, he says you got to put all the pieces back at the end of the game. Right? Doesn't matter how much or how little you stacked. Right? You got to put it back. And the only thing that you can take with you after you close up a game of Monopoly really is your integrity. Interesting, isn't it? Like, there's winners and losers to be sure, but, you know, a cheater is forever. A cheater is forever. Right? And we sometimes get sidetracked and focused on things that don't really matter. Things that the Father isn't really impressed by. Right? Things that if, uh, you know, things that by the time you get to the end of a life, you're you're going to look back and be like, I I did a lot of ladder climbing to be sure, but it was the wrong ladder. It was the wrong ladder. You get to the top rung and realize that it's all emptiness up here. That it's all emptiness up here. Right? So the other uh, the other verse that I wanted to that I wanted to mention here as far as pertains to our topic today, right? Is in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 um, starting in eh, verse 20 or 21 doesn't particularly matter where we start. Uh doesn't particularly matter where we start here, right? Oh, man. Um, and this, we're going to mention a principle here. <laughs> right, we're, we're going to mention a principle here um, that's not always terribly popular. Yeah, it's not always terribly popular. And it's about self-sacrifice and self-denial, right? So I guess we'll start in verse 21. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. What a question. They wish to see Jesus. That's a good desire. You know, like many of us, you know, we too wish to see Jesus. You know, I'm reading the scriptures, I'm doing the things, I want to see Jesus. Why does it feel like I'm not? Right? (laughs) Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Oh, that's awesome. All right, they want to see Jesus, and Jesus is saying, Well, it's the time for the Son of Man to be glorified, so you're going to see something awesome. Oh, sweet. Well, let's keep going. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What does he mean? He keeps going. Verse 25. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor me him. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Right? Servants of Christ follow Christ. Clear principle, but even clearer principle, right? He says it right there in his parable. 
Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, just after he says this, the, we go right into the Gethsemane. No, almost Gethsemane. Um, you know, where Jesus uh, talks about his soul being troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. Right? So, what is Jesus saying in that passage, right? He is the grain of wheat that has to go into the earth and die. And unless he, and if he doesn't, no one else gets saved, right? Your salvation, your eternal life depended on the suffering and death of Christ. All right? He had to die. He had to die so that he wouldn't. And not so that he wouldn't be alone, but, you know, as far as the parable goes, right? Like if he wants, uh, you know, if he wants to give life to us, he's got to die so that we can obtain it. He's got to. There's no other way. There's no other way. And I just love that that is Jesus's answer to their request to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And what is his answer? He says, well, it's about time for me to be glorified. Right? It's almost time for me to die. You want to see who I am? Look to my death. Right? And that's tough. That's tough. And then he doubles down on it. He doubles down on it, saying, Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Right now, that word that word hate in the Greek is just a bit more all encompassing and deep <laughs> than you know our than the closest English equivalent, which is just hate. Um, it it, it really just means to hold in lesser esteem, right? Like whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever holds his life in this world in lesser esteem than the kingdom will keep it for eternal life. Right? It's a tough question, man. Like, do you love your life more than the kingdom? Do you love your way of living right now? If Jesus were to knock on your door right now or come to you in a dream or some such thing and say to you that he wants your entire life to change, maybe not even your entire life. He just wants a change to happen, right? And he sell your car. You know, sell all your fancy cars so that you've only got one left. All right, sell the yacht, right? Sell the fancy cars. Right, just keep one or two, right? Would your soul be sad? Right? And don't act all holier than thou, right? It's just you and me, right? It's just us on a podcast, man. And I am at least honest enough to admit that yeah, yeah, there there are times where there are times where I, I feel that covetousness in me when you know there's a awesome kingdom opportunity and it would just take some sacrifice on my part you know no playstation tonight because you're going to be out in the streets witnessing you know to the poor and the motels and the hotels and stuff in the rougher areas of town right no uh you know no getting a bunch of fast food for you this week because you're going to be saving up that money to you know to bless somebody with right Right? You know what I mean? Like, I know you worked hard to get this respiratory therapy job. Are you willing to put that on the line and risk it and risk offending someone to the point of being fired if it means you share the good news of Jesus with them? Right? Which one do you love more? The chance to serve in the kingdom, the chance to follow Christ where he goes, where he went, or your life on this earth, in this world? Which one do you really value more? Don't answer now, right? Let Take that question to God in an honest prayer and let him show you where you lie and let his, uh, and let his spirit show you the things that need to be freshly, uh, freshly given over to him, right? Let's just be honest and then let's handle it, right? Let's not be like Peter <laughs> before the crucifixion, right? No, Jesus, I'm perfectly faithful. I'll never betray you. All right, admit that the flesh is weak. Admit that you're weak. 
and let Jesus show you. Let Jesus show you who he is. Gaze upon his death. Gaze upon the suffering. And see your call there too, right? Because we're in him. We're called to follow in his steps. First Peter, right? He gave up his life and died, right? Now, maybe, maybe sacrifice doesn't include your death, but who knows? Maybe it will. Are you willing? Are you willing? And maybe if and maybe you're not willing to go that far yet. Are you willing to be made willing? Right? I know I know what that's like. I'm there in a boat with you, man. I ain't perfect. I'm not perfect. That's part of what this podcast even is. At least for me, it, it is a sacrifice. I'm I'm not terribly looking forward to giving up. Uh, to, to giving up my, you know, my part-time gig and EMS. I liked, I like taking calls. I like riding on uh, the ambulances. I like rough riding through the tougher parts of the county. I love doing rescue work like that. All right, but God, he, but God showed me. He was like, look, man, like to do this, to do the deeper desire of your heart of committing a decent amount of time to the kingdom of committing enough time to kingdom work like this podcast, like discipling, like doing all the things that you want to do to do that. You're going to have to cut some other things out of your life. You're going to have to restructure your chessboard. All right. You're going to have to get rid of some things in a lot of ways. You're going to have to go into the ground and die that the kingdom agenda might live and that you might spark life in other hearts. Right. I get it. I get it in so many ways, in ways that probably be explored in further episodes, right? Right? But he says it, and he's clear about it. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, right? That, that's a command. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Not might follow. Not you have an option. You must follow him, right? And to follow him, he needs to be leading you by the Spirit. And where I am, Jesus says, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Right? That's a promise. The Father will honor you if you serve Jesus. He will. He will. But to serve Jesus, you got to follow him. And you got to know where Jesus is at. Where is Jesus wanting to work? You go there. But to do that, you got to be searching after him in your prayer closet. To do that, you got to be searching after knowing him through his word. Right? Get around some believers that actually want to follow Christ, that actually want to follow him, right? I know it might be tough in our culture, but that's the call. That's the call. Come die with me, saints. Come on. If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Let him die daily and follow me. Am I perfect at it? No. But what I can say is that that's where joy is at. That's where peace is at. That's where life is at in learning how to die to yourself daily and learning how to walk in the supernatural of just, Jesus, how can I serve your kingdom today? How can I serve you and your kingdom agenda today? Right? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that my life is built on your grace and not on my perceived merit. Thank you that my life is built on and lived out of the generosity of the Father and the Son who both suffered in their own way from me. That I would have a way to be untied from my sins. I mean, come on. What what else is there? What else is there, right? Um, And as we kind of tie up this this return episode, I just want to leave you with a quote from uh, from A.W. Tozer. Right, And he says this, and let this hit you, right? Final pulse check. (laughs) You know, we'll hardly get our feet out of time and into eternity that will bow our heads in shame and humiliation. We'll gaze on eternity and say, my God, look at all the riches that were there in Jesus Christ ready for the taking, and I've come to the judgment seat almost a pauper. Right, And I've come to the judgment seat almost a pauper. 
That's every one of those riches comes through learning how to die to yourself, right? And go after the kingdom agenda, no matter what the cost. What does Jesus want you to do, right? Does he want you to serve someone in your family, in your community, right? Probably. Does he want you to share the gospel with somebody in your life? Most definitely, right? And I'm right there in your boat, man. I ain't going to give you all challenges that I'm not also living, dude, right? Ask Jesus to show you ways to serve fellow believers and unbelievers, right? For the sake of the kingdom. And ask Jesus, right? Who can I share the good news of you with? Help me do that. And actually step out in faith and do that, right? Ask God to show you where you're putting too much stock in the things of this world, right? And sever them. Give them over to God in your heart, right? The poor in spirit inherit the kingdom, right? Those that realize that they are but paupers, if not for the king thinking of them and dying for them, right? Hey, it's been the foreign saints, man been the foreign saints we're back we are back and i'm excited i'm excited right pulse check for those who die daily A pulse check for those who die daily until next time peace